Hello everyone. I put together this lesson on how to draw rhinos and hippos. I will be splitting this video into two sections for each animal. We will definitely focus on the various processes of gesture, form, anatomy, and lots of techniques that you can take into the field and feel very confident in using. A couple of points as I start this is the drawing has been sped up about twice its regular pace. That way it picks up a good brisk pace, but you can still figure out the process. Second point is the drawing is a little underexposed and darker so you can pick up all the marks, the good and the bad, so you can understand the whole process. These are bulkier animals, built low to the ground. So though I add the general gesture as a start, I almost immediately go to the larger forms and shapes for proportion comparisons. After I pop in the general anatomical uh, landmarks like the kneecaps and the ground plane, what I'll do is then I'm pretty sure of it and I'll go in and actually kind of knock in the legs, uh, the size of them, just again to get the general proportions laid out. Make sure that everything's going to be working as I articulate these forms. You may notice that I draw the animal a little bit thinner than the photograph because what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep comparing the proportions I have and add that weight a little bit more as I sort of fiddle around with the legs to get those the right size. Again, considering they're so thin in comparison to the entire big bulk of uh, this rhinoceros. Remember this whole process is built for drawing out the field. It's a zoo. So this animal, even though it doesn't move a lot, it will be sort of meandering around. So that's why it's so sketchy. I'm not quite certain, even though I'm using a photograph of what I want to format or what I really want to bring out as a focal point later. Here's a good case in point. If you look at the diagram on the upper right, it's really heavily outlined where the anatomy is. Again, it's a diagram. It's meant to show where everything is. So then when you transfer that information into the actual drawing, you can see the lines I'm using are very light and I don't outline the bones, I just accent where they come to the surface or the track they leave inside the body. That way when I put the form on top of it, I'll understand where to attach it, make it much more dynamic. And even when I put the shading in, it'll do the same thing. It'll flow over the body forms and explain the anatomy very dynamically uh, rather than being stiff and outlined. That outline and value shading that you put into it will really help define the flow, the visual flow through the animal and make it a lot more appealing to the eye and a lot more solid if you're going for more of a sculptural kind of look to it. Remember you're gaining all that information now so when you're out in the field at the zoo and you watch this large animal move around and these little accent points sort of pop up you'll know where to construct it and where all the pieces flow together so it'll be a really nice uh, finished, complete concept. This approach certainly comes in hand when you're dealing with the head here. And the fact that uh, the rhino's head's proportions are a little strange, and even the shape is, it's got that sort of curving box. And what I'm doing right now is throwing the axis lines in to make sure that the features all sort of line up. I definitely handle that form like a large box, because you can see I have a top place where the horns fit into, and the side plane that falls pretty vertically from that top and where the ears attach and where the eye is in the middle of the head. Don't worry, we are going to return to the head later for a further examination of how to put that together. What I'm doing with that orange pencil is I'm laying in sort of the perimeters of where the muscles are. And you wouldn't think that you would see large muscles on the inside of that thick hide of this animal, but you really do because what it does is defines the bigger form. And those muscles are massive. If you use source material, like an anatomy book, you'll be able to see that uh, diagram on the upper right is actually done from a 15,000-year-old uh, rhino skeleton that I put the muscles on top of to give it more bulk and mass. Once you learn the vocabulary of the anatomy and where to place stuff, it's almost like connecting the dots, and you'll be able to get a nice dynamic movement because you can squash and stretch the results of those forms, depending on the animal's movements. Now we move on to the rhino's front and back feet. Perhaps you can see that I changed it into like drum shapes, cylinders, and the toenails are basically sort of triangular pyramidal shapes that I insert into the feet. Again, I'm really careful with these because that's going to hold the whole figure up and it's got to sort of place itself on the ground and show the footprint and the weight of the figure. 
They're also not just outlined. You can see the tubes overlap one another. I also fold in the anatomy, like the tendons on the back of the foot there, uh, going into the muscle mass that's there. Just hint at it right now. I'm not going to finish it. Uh, one of the last steps will be it'll come to sh show the compression wrinkles in it, but not at this point. Uh, the diagram is an Indian rhinoceros, and you can see that plating that overlaps the back legs. Again, it overlaps it. One form fits into the other to make it look more dynamic and more three-dimensional. As we move into the front legs, you can see that the uh, individual toes stick out a lot more and the legs are actually a little bit thinner than the back ones. Uh, what I mean by thinner is, is you don't make them skinny. They're certainly powerful and a little bit on the angular side. Uh, but again, you really pay attention to that ground plane. So when you place those feet on the ground, they don't float. They actually are anchored into that ground. Now as we move back to the whole rhinoceros drawing here, I have to explain that rarely, if ever, do I just hammer in the feet and then move on to the other stuff. Is that a normal drawing when I go out in the zoo, I'm sort of all over it and comparing all the different pieces, maybe accenting one leg, uh, but certainly making sure that it works in with the concept of the whole thing. That's what this demo here is that it's a process piece, uh, not necessarily a reflection of exactly how you should put it together. As I continue to build this up, you'll notice what I'm doing is turning that pencil on the side and accenting uh, areas where the scapula comes against the uh, front of the humerus and in the back where the uh, femur makes that nice dark curve against where the knee is and where the legs are coming together and the overlap in the chest into the stomach. The general idea is those overlaps push the three-dimensionality of the form into a foreground, middle ground, and background situation. And this transparent overlapping techniques works real well even in a two minute long gesture drawing. Okay, now we're moving back to the head like I said we would. So when I tend to view these uh, larger animals here, I really sort of cross contour wireframe the head so I understand the top planes and the side planes where everything fits together. That way as a animal moves their head around, I can go with it and go with my first concept. Even though I may not even see uh, the animal's head after a few minutes, I know exactly where everything belongs and I can articulate that by knowing sort of the rules of it and the construction of how to put it together. Knowing this idea of form and three dimension actually makes it a lot stronger for you as an artist because instead of getting uh, depressed or downhearted when the animal moves its head, you'll know where things are. And by having those general landmarks, you'll be able to build the form up and make it really convincing just as long as it's in proportion and it works in space and connects in with the neck really well. It's just a heck of a lot better creative process. The two photographs I have up are an Indian rhino on the top and an African black rhino on the bottom. When I go to build up the uh, final old accents in here. You'll see I pop in the jawline up right below the eye and then I come back in the muzzle and then turn that angle back towards the jaw and leave that little section of muzzle in between the eye and the nose for the muscles that are there. Hopefully you'll see when we pull out and see the whole drawing that the head integrates back in with the rest of the drawing and complements the rest of the form that's there. Those little secondary forms like the eyelids, uh, the nostrils, and where the ears fit into the head are like really super important make for a convincing portrait. Speaking of portraits, I'm going to do this layout, design, and final form and features of this Indian rhinoceros. The last one we did was an African rhinoceros, so I figured I'd change it up a little bit, even change the angle of the uh, forms that I'm going to draw. So I'm using that uh, diagram of the African rhino's head as a starting point. Normally when I draw an Indian rhinoceros' head, the uh, head's a lot more of a triangular shape. Uh, the African rhino has more of a curving box-like shape. But a lot of the landmarks are very similar, and you'll see that in this drawing. I'm using this red pencil to sort of plot out uh, the sort of proportions of the head first. Again, like I've said before, this is a 
demo drawing, a process drawing, not necessarily what I would do in the field. Perhaps you notice that uh, even though I'm using these photographs uh, as my source material, I've changed them. As I mentioned before, I'm able to take these forms and shift them in any direction that I want to. So I'm using them just as reference and then taking those features and the general proportions and process of it and change it around so it becomes a little bit more on the sculptural side and it's a different viewpoint than the last one we did. And understanding those big forms is really important so you can move them around in space. That way uh, you'll be really mobile and there'll be a lot more confidence as you're drawing. You're knowing that you're able to like sort of shift around and use that creative license uh, to be able to make for a stronger drawing rather than just copying perhaps what you see. I'll tell you though, I'm paying special attention to where the features are located in relationship to the shape and the form there. Placing them just right and looking at the relationship between say the eyes, the mouth, the nostril. If you look really closely, you can see there's an upward curving line that goes between the nostrils, the eyeball, and the ears. It goes on for sure on both sides, not just one, and just for a lot of other animals too. So I always use that to kind of keep things in mind. I'm dropping in here now to uh, sort of bump up the features a little bit more. And this is important just because you know how they operate and how they overlap and how they show a lot more of the personality of the creature. And this can be achieved even in short drawings and the fact that you'll learn how to abbreviate this stuff and then get it down really quickly and hit just the really major uh, accents of the animal that you're drawing. Uh, having said that though, it's really important that you study this and you get things like the hair pattern that comes out of the top of the ear, even the growth in the ear, the way the ears sort of attach to the head like you're putting a ketchup bottle into a cup and uh, things like the jawline, that weight that comes off the jowls in the bottom of the neck, and even things like uh, this little V shape uh, in the front of the mouth, in the front of the uh, animal there, uh, articulating up the nostrils on both sides. Uh, again, you're, everything's like really sort of symmetrical and you gotta give hints on the outside contour on the other side of where these things are and where they fit into one another. But it all has to fit in the proportions of the animal. So make sure that you get that right. You get those verticals and horizontals, the, you know, basically the front plate on the top of the head and the vertical on the side. Make sure those work in tandem. As we go through this process here and I draw this, I always sort of notice that the animal that I draw on screen is always a little bit more on the generic side. That's why I really love drawing at the zoo because as you can see in that drawing on the left hand side with that Indian uh, rhino, the fact it's floating in a pond and it's got a lot more wrinkles and a lot more bumps and grooves and this uh, African rhino here has a lot more uh, personality, uh, eyelashes and eyebrows and eyelids are a lot more on the heavy side horns point in different directions the ears have a uniqueness to them overall it's, it's, it has much more of an impact and personality that you want to pick up and you do that as you hit the gesture on it you your eyes flow over the top of this information and you know as a design you can put it in later successfully so now we're going to move on to the hippopotamus and even more than drawing the rhino you can see I'm really really hitting the uh, volumes really pretty quickly do a little shape design. You can see that sort of egg shape for the rib cage, uh, the box for the head, and then a sweeping line that goes through the bottom of the stomach into the legs. I'm pretty confident in my overall design and proportion, so I'm just gonna lay the legs in pretty quick. Uh, number one, they're very simple to do. I treat them almost sort of as outlines, something I rarely do on other animals, but since there's so much bulk here, I really wanna be able to get the idea, the sort of gestalt of the animal pretty fast. So I try to record those larger forms of the head, the body, and the legs and get them all working in tandem pretty darn fast. So to me the forms and the personality of the hippo's uh, head portrait, if you want to call it, is uh, like really crucial for me to get this down in relationship to all the rest of the bulk. And so I'm going to jump on that pretty fast uh, just to establish it and get that larger form set out. I always seem to have a little bit of problem trying to get that bigger skull shape and those muzzles to work together with the other part of it. Uh, I may have done this for just lots and lots of years. It doesn't mean I still don't have uh, trouble putting things together.
if you're fairly new to this whole animal drawing thing and uh, you go on field trips or you go to the zoo to draw and you're nervous about it uh, one little hint is what you do is either go to YouTube or just maybe even grab some photographic reference and uh, knock in some real quick light drawings on your pad you know five or six for per page and then as the animal moves into that position you can jump on uh, that one certain drawing or series of drawings that you're working on and as the an animal moves into another pose you might have a light drawing you can jump onto that one too so you'd be literally uh, not stymied moving from uh, one sort of creation to another you just be really fluid and it builds a lot more confidence in your uh, work process I must admit one thing that I see that a lot of students and artists do, they treat these larger animals like hippos and rhinos, sort of like balloons, and they draw all these like big curving lines. And you have to remember that skeletal system, that form, even something like uh, this hippo that has a lot of fat in it, a lot of weight to it, it hangs off of that uh, sort of superstructure. And then the larger, say more rounded lines are underneath, not on the top. And then that way you get that sort of uh, core shadows that uh, happen down there. And you can see as I punch in the, uh, the eyes and the nose that I add those like curving lines uh, back in underneath where the rib cage is and even in the ligaments in the back leg. You may notice in the legs I keep a lot of straight lines. That's because it's a lot of bone and a lot of tendon there. So if I end up drawing a lot of curves there, it's just going to add a whole bunch of, of unnecessary uh, weight to this animal and those sharper straighter lines makes it a lot more on the athletic side um, makes it look like there's a good uh, combination and contrast between the rounded areas uh, say in the head and in the body it just makes for a heck of a lot more dynamic drawing i'm going to do some drawing and uh, bust out some more of the uh, form on this animal Gonna lay in that green line for the ground plane and uh, show you where the center of gravity is over the top of the chest and then uh, work up the rest of the drawing. So this last little piece right here, a little compare and contrast to the drawing to the photograph, you notice I drew the head a little bit larger. Uh, just because uh, some of the animals I've seen have pretty large heads in relationship to their body and I wanted to lay that out uh, rather than just copy the photograph. So now I'm going to do the layout and design of this uh, hippo's head looking somewhat from the front. I changed the angle a little bit to show a little bit uh, less of the uh, right hand side, his right hand side, our left hand side of his head and do a little bit of rearranging again Rather than just copy the photograph, I change the slight direction in the head, and then uh, I can make it do what I need to do on it uh, and rearrange the features and the other parts so, uh, once again, it fits more my design rather than just copying. Having said that, though, I'm really busting down the uh, structure of it. What I mean by structure is you can really see that I'm hitting the planes, making sure that the features are symmetrical, uh, going back and forth, those cross contour lines again sort of uh, wire framing out the form. In general, just sort of placing everything up and building it up so it has much more of sort of a sculptural look on it. And you might see that in the uh, eyes that a diagram I have on the upper left. That's out of my animal drawing book and the axis lines that run across and even the uh, anatomical structure of the skull underneath it and the way the eyes fit in are really important because what it does is it shows that sort of knowledge. Uh, so when you move to a front view, uh, you have the, the same kind of structure in there, it's just turned in a different direction. Much more sculptural and much more overlapping. And as I said before, this can work even for really, really quick drawings where you basically lay down a pretty quick shape, box it out a little bit, kind of go with that aircraft carrier shape on the top of the head. As I mentioned before, the nostrils, the eyes, and the ears sort of flow together in a slightly curving line from front to back. And then you lay in those large shapes, those large boxy shapes for the jaw and for the muzzle in the front as you can see in the photograph.
So when we get to this part in it, uh, I take that generic form and I try to push a little bit more, uh, making stuff not so symmetrical, uh, putting more weight on one side or the other, uh, making the chin a little bit more triangular like I've seen in a lot of hippos. A lot of this comes through just lots and lots of observation and making conceptual decisions about what I want to do with it and what I want to focus on and what I don't want to focus on. Uh, a lot of times I'll drag the ears up a little bit more. Uh, certainly put a focus on the eyes and that front plane that goes from the back of the head to the where the front of the nostrils are. So when I put it in the water, as you'll see later, it floats really well and it has those uh, ripples will whip across the uh, head in a very convincing manner. More time to draw, less time to talk. And this was the effect I was talking about when the water, whether it's an Indian rhinoceros or the hippo, when it submerges itself in water, that water will flow around those forms and look very convincing and sort of help the personality of the animal. And of course, make your drawing look better. Now, I must admit, I don't put a lot of whiskers on animals, but hippos I do. But you may notice when I draw them, I don't just kind of like poke them in there. I draw them at a 90 degree angle to the form of the muzzle. That way they're convincing. Uh, I, once again, like I said before, this drawing's a little bit more on the generic side, and uh, there's a lot more irregularities I would put to it, sort of add and subtract. But uh, in this drawing, it's the process that's more important rather than the individual personality of the animal that I create. And perhaps you can see more of that personality, that individual idea of the animal, when we move into these uh, drawings that I've done actually at the zoo. Drawings that I hope uh, document a unique animal and you can see again as I put the shading on it, it complements the form and the design that I've already put together. These are both drawings that I've used this process on, but I've spun it so there's a lot more sort of texture and a lot more form and a lot more light logic on each one of them. And now bring up the reference photograph so you can take a look at that and make the comparison to the drawing that I did. The best thing to do is not just look at the results, but go back and look at the process and look at the structure that I applied to it. So I added a couple pages of drawings that I cobbled together from visits to the zoo. And you can see the process in practice in materials like ink, markers, pencil, and fountain pen. And here's some mixed media drawings of uh, hippos. Hippos like to spend a lot of time in water, so make sure that you study that effect uh, before you go to the zoo so you can competently put that all together. So in closing here, I'd like to thank you for visiting uh, this video and there's other videos as well. So uh, subscribe to my channel, uh, like and certainly comment and here's my animal drawing books that I've published and illustrated. They're available on Amazon.com and they're chock full information. There's a ton of drawings, illustrations, diagrams and the text is really short and sweet as well. So thanks a lot. Bye.